It's interesting you say in the book that the night you got that phone call, sleep eluded you. Um, in a karmic twist of fate, in 2005, you actually ended up acquiring their yeah, company. Yeah, yeah. How did you sleep that night? <laughs>
to some extent, but you know, a lot of people say that you know you are succeeded because you are lucky. Luck, everybody gets luck streaks, you know. So, of course, destiny is important, but that's not the reason for a person's success. I think success on a perpetual basis. If you look at a long term, I mean, one lucky break you will get. Of course, that was destiny. But if you say that all your life, you know, it's destiny which has played a role, that's completely wrong. I think a lot will depend how you are able to encash on that opportunity which is thrown up by destiny. You know, a lot of people get a lot of opportunities. It comes their way, but they don't do anything about it. So the destiny is, I mean, it's wasted. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mr. Mariwala, I when I I studied your career in the run-up to this, um, and I reread your book, Harsh Realities, which is a fantastic book. And one thing that really struck me about your career and your approach to business, let me put it that way, is there is this incredible focus mm. and the ability to say no. My guess is you said no more than yes more in life, yeah. and 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 I say that as a compliment. Yeah. It's important to know where to spend your time and energy. You're absolutely right. Yeah. And I want to use a critical event in the history of Marico yeah. to talk about that and the ways focus shows up in a variety of ways when you're working. Yeah. So I want to talk about the HUL attempt at buying Marico. Sure. Yeah. And you narrate the incident yeah. in the book and when you got that ill-fated phone call um, saying, let me put it nicely, asking if you would like. <laughs> and the fascinating thing is that if you look at your response to that, mm -hmm. one is it wasn't a volatile reaction. It was a well thought out, well constructed mm. sort of response. But more importantly, you were very focused on understanding what are the things that actually matter. And there's one thing that really struck me, which is you quickly came to the realization that it may seem Mariko is the David to HUL's Goliath, but you were in a sense not facing Goliath. You were facing a section of Goliath. The person you were going to yeah. essentially go to war with was not the main man in charge. Yeah. It was a lieutenant rather than a general. Can you talk to me about how you think about focus and, and what do you think gives you that focus in life? Is it some internal wiring or what else is it? So I don't know what has led to this streak of focus, but you're absolutely right. I'm very focused. I strongly believe that focus leads to depth and depth leads to excellence. And if you want to succeed in whatever you do, uh, you have to be focused. There are examples of businessmen who are not focused and also successful, but they are very rare. So that's why you see that if you go into an unrelated business, the chances of your success are much lesser than you expand into your current business or to adjacencies of what you're doing currently. The chances of your success are better because you don't go through your learning curve and you're able to concentrate on on the business because of focus. And you're able to go much, much deeper. And it leads to a far more, shall I say, sustainable, stronger organization because you are so focused there, you are taking all the steps to improve your capability, to ensure that you are two steps ahead of competition, and to ensure that the organization is built on very solid grounds. So my belief in focus is, is very, very high. And it has helped us in terms of uh, our product portfolio. And to what you were saying earlier, you know, if you get an opportunity to into some unfocused area mm -hmm. or some completely different area, because you have a focused approach, it's very easy to say no. Because the most tempting thing for any entrepreneur mm -hmm. is getting lots of ideas and opportunities are there. But I think at some stage you need to decide whether are you really going to pursue each and every opportunity or it makes sense for you to say no. So I think focus helps you to say no because it is something unrelated and you say I want to be on only related. Now if the business in your related or your current business does not have opportunities for growth then of course you have to go beyond that because you have to grow the business and growth is very important. I think growth is like oxygen for any business. You have to make the organization grow and if the growth doesn't happen then all the stakeholders start losing interest whether it's your employees your, or shareholders whoever it is you know so to sum up i would say that focus is very critical and i would deviate away from focus only if my current business is not able to grow or i am not able to diversify into related adjacencies 
uh, and I have to go through completely new. Because ultimately, I have to drive growth. And if that current business doesn't offer opportunity for growth, then I have to look at something completely different. But if I had to look at something different, then it has to be, you have to remove escape buttons, you know, because you can't expect, and I think many entrepreneurs tend to take shortcuts by asking the same team which is managing a current business to look at something new. And because their hands are so tied up and their competency is towards a certain business they are currently managing, they are not able to think differently. And I'll just give you one or two examples, you know, and two examples I'll give you, you know, when we were many years back, we were only present in India and we were getting opportunities to go outside India. Because India business was so big, we decided to hand over the international opportunities to the India head of sales and marketing. But because India was so big, the overall attention given to international market was so low that we made a presence but very minor. Until one fine day we said that international is very important to us. We will remove the escape button. This guy is too much into India, so we will appoint a senior person. That person's role will only be international business because international business is very different than Indian business, you know. The customer is different, the culture, the people, the opportunities could be different, the brands you could launch internationally different. So once we did that, we expanded organically to markets like Bangladesh, neighboring markets, Middle East. That person, we identified opportunities for acquisition in some countries like Egypt, Vietnam, we acquired companies and basically we expanded and made, went international and today about more than 25% of our turnover comes from international markets. Yeah. But the key thing was removing escape buttons, you know. Mm. Yeah. And the same thing happened with Kai, you know, I was getting a lot of ideas and to some extent I've gone out of focus in terms of a new business was when we launched Kai, you know. It's, it's completely different business compared to Marico. Of course, it is a brand, it is in skincare, but it is a service business and very, very different, you know. Yeah. But I, earlier I would go back to my own team to expand and it would just get, not get the right. So I moved, but two persons I removed from my team and they reported directly to me to look at new business opportunity and that's how I happened. But if I had not removed those two persons mm -hmm. and relied on my existing team of Marico, I would never have gone into a new business. Now, that was sound decision or I'm not getting into it. But uh, it's not done as well as I thought it would be. So I think I'm more and more convinced that focus is very important. There are exceptions like Ambani and Reliance where they've gone to completely unrelated business and very successful. But that's very few and many other organizations which have gone beyond what uh, what they were doing in today's environment. Maybe 20 years back when the competitive environment was much lesser, you could succeed in new businesses. But today, most businesses you go into are, are the degree of competition has increased dramatically compared to the past. This landscape is littered with yes. companies that yeah. diversified incorrectly, yeah. right? I mean, globally, it's not just in India. Coming oh, to your, yeah. I mean, I didn't finish your question about the levers part, you know. So you were right, I, you know, I didn't uh, react uh, immediately in terms of that threat and I, within me I was quite confident we could meet that but you know, I think I am, uh, I am a deliberative risk taker. I don't risk take risk, I go into a little bit more detail, you know, so I had to, my, you may call it my intuition, you may call it my judgment of taking them on was, I had to go a little deeper. So I met uh, Karsan Bhai Patil of uh, Nirma. I went to Ahmedabad just to meet him because he was taking on levers and I met many other people. And then internally discussing with my team came to the conclusion we'll take them on. So it was just not my personal judgment, my intuition, but it was verified and value added by others also. It's interesting, you say in the book that the night you got that phone call, sleep eluded you. Um, in a karmic twist of fate, in 2005, you actually ended up acquiring their yeah, company. Yeah, yeah. How did you sleep that night? <laughs> no, it was a great moment internally for, um, for all of us. I mean, internally within the organization, we felt elated, we felt great about it. Yeah. So it was, uh, I mean, as you said, as I said earlier, during that phase of the, when you're taking them on, there was a lot of stress. Yeah. 
but when you came out winners of course there was a great feeling you know yeah. you know in that phase it it seems impossible today but there was a point in that phase when marico as a public listed company yeah. was trading in a at a single digit yes. p yeah when that happened did you ever second guess yourself did you ever wonder you know maybe i should just give in i should just give up no 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 never no i i mean there was no doubt in my mind that to give up you know because i i mean two things one is i was confident about the fact that we were in this business for much much longer time we knew the business inside out we had a very strong brand they could not have hit us except in the area of distribution and marketing spends for which we took some action so rationally we analyzed uh, and came to the conclusion that i mean at the most we may suffer for a few years mm -hmm. and uh, i think that exactly happened for one or two years our margins were lower but uh, never a doubt that we will uh, we will sell out to them yeah. and and do you think that that sort of mindset yeah. that almost warrior mindset that you know it doesn't matter what you throw at me i'll come out on top do you think that that is something you've developed over time or is it's a gift from god i don't know but maybe i think it's a gift from god you know sometimes but i think more than that you know sometimes some people may want to end cash on something you know there are different type of entrepreneurs there are some entrepreneurs who are serial entrepreneurs they will start something they sell it off they start something else i am not the serial entrepreneur i want to be in the business from a long term point of view so that's my mindset number 2 i money does not excite me beyond a point you know it's not going to take you anywhere some people end cash on it i will have a lot of wealth i will enjoy life these are all myths you know you can't enjoy money beyond a point it's not going to impact you know so my lifestyle may not have changed at all you know but just because i'm more wealthy doesn't mean that i will lead a different lifestyle you know you think you would have been unhappy if you forget forget under duress but even if you at a very attractive valuation sold out how long do you think it would take you to come back and realize i'm too bored i need to get on with oh, immediately. Yeah. <laughs> immediately immediately think you would last even 6 months i don't think so i would not last one month or so <laughs> yeah it, it, because that's how i am built you know i i mean i have to be occupied even after i step down uh, as the managing director i had to take steps to keep myself occupied not in an operational role but what beyond marico you know yeah. and i think that's uh, reinventing yourself at different stages in life you know you have to reinvent yourself because then what and i was not able to do what i am doing today mm. and i would not have been able to do that if i was still in operational but now i have a lot of time so i have proactively i have done a lot of things which which i couldn't have done it earlier yeah. i want to talk about marico's journey as a listed entity yeah. you maybe you know you went public maybe earlier than you otherwise would have if things had been different but it's an interesting um case study because you grew up in the public eye versus a lot of what what a lot of companies do today which is they come as far more mature companies when they come to public markets. Yeah. What was your experience growing up in the public eye and and do you what do you think were the advantages and and you know drawbacks of doing that? Yeah. So I think first of all circumstances forced me to go public. So it was and I think many people say should you go public and I think my answer to that is always been it's a means to an end. Mm -hmm. Why do you want to go public? Now if there are some investors who invest in your company they want to exit then public going public could be an option. it could be selling it to some other investor also but in my case the key issue was i had taken a lot of debt because i had bought over some of my other family members then i had taken a lot of debt in my personal hands and i had to and at that time the the pe culture was not present in 96 you know so i was forced to go public having said that we went public at a time when we had strong brands but they were perceived as branded commodities you know so we were always branded as uh, always perceived as a branded commodity player not an fmcg player so our challenge was though the brands were very strong our margins were good was to how do you transit toward a valuation of an fmcg company which is almost double or treble in terms of price to earning multiple compared to a branded commodities player uh, and i think that journey began once we be, became public we said that we have to be in the same bracket as the fmcg index and we can't be perceived as a branded commodities which meant taking a lot of action at our end action in terms of improving our product portfolio going into more value added products 
ensuring that on a quarterly basis we'll go on showing growth. And I think if I remember rightly, almost 50 quarters in a row we showed top line and bottom line growth, which meant that we are not a branded commodity player. Because if you're a branded commodity player, you will be subject to commodity prices and you know profitability fluctuating with, with the fluctuation in commodity prices. So we went for more value addition, consistent performance. We became far more transparent in terms of our our overall sharing of information. Governance played a very important role. So a combination of these four or five things helped us move towards a multiple of, and we went public 13, it fell to 7, 8, and now in the range of 50, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, I, I, I still am amazed at the fact that it ever reached 7, 8. You think about it, at the worst time in the GFC, yeah. it was 20. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm, I'm thinking if someone offered me Maricor eight times, I'd bite his arm off right now. <laughs> but you know, that time it was perception yeah. about the threat from levers. You know, I think that drove it that, you know, I'm a fool, foolish person to take on <laughs> a giant like levers and you know, I will suffer. Right. So. Right. You know, I want to come back to something you touched upon earlier, which is creating the right team. Yeah. and. Often in an organization's journey, the people who are useful at a one crore level mm. are not the right people at 100 crore, and then you need a third team at 1,000 crores. Yes. Can you talk about finding the right people yes. as, as a leader, and, and what do you think has worked in before getting them on board, yeah. knowing that this is the right guy? See, I think it, it all depends on the scale, you know, what kind of leadership team you require, because when you're small, it's relatively simple. Mm. Uh, the business is simple because you don't have specialist functions uh, and because you're small you can't afford a very high level of talent also. And even if you get a high level talent with a very small business, then they will also get frustrated because they, unless they are, there is huge scope for them to, to grow, you know. So I think a lot depends on what the business can, can afford. Those days again we didn't have those luxury of making losses and growing sales and I still don't know how to <laughs> do that. So, I mean, business has to show profits and if you consider that as, as given, then I mean, how much can you pay an individual? Uh, would, and if you, don't, if you don't have that kind of budgets, you will take individuals at, at that level of competency, you know. Mm -hmm. But as the business grows, then your level of complexity increases. And the business may grow because of newer product lines, newer geographies, so it becomes far more complex. So as complexity increases, scale increases, you need a different type of talent. Mm -hmm. Now there may be some individuals who can be exceptions, they are able to adapt to the change circumstances in terms of complexity, in terms of scale. But I've seen that many a times, you know, that same individual is not able to cope. And multiple times, I have asked those people to go, those who are very relevant at some stage, not getting relevant. And what do you do then, you know, you, you can't continue with them, you can't reward loyalty because it will impact your performance. So, ask them to go, but do it in a human manner, you know. Give them some time to find some option and have, have a replacement at a far higher competency level. And that has happened, I mean, if I look back at my own journey, it must have happened two, three, four times because, you know, we grew from 100 crores to 10,000 crores. So, you know, so, every time uh, at some juncture, you know, you say that now we need to change the level of competency within the team. And the team itself has undergone change. You know? So I don't have some people who have been with me for 40 years, for example. You know? yeah. I want to um, just talk a bit about how how you went about building the Marico brand. And, and I say Marico and of course the individual yeah. brands under parachutes or follow and so on. In your mind, yeah. what what does parachute and its brand, oh, sorry, Marico and its brands mean to the average consumer today? What is it that comes to their mind when they think of that? So, so I think the first thing which drives the consumer is the brand name, whether it's parachute or Sapphola or whichever brand they're buying, you know. And our challenge with the brand name of the company is more in the corporate end, not with the consumer. Consumer most many consumers, even 50 percent, I, I don't have data, See, 50, 60 percent, they will not even know which company it's coming from. So basically they are buying a parachute or something. But it's important to build the brand, company brand. 
because to attract talent, to retain talent, you know, if I want to recruit you and, you know, if I tell you uh, Marico and if you tell your parents uh, Marico and they don't know about Marico, then they'll say, why do you want to join? Join Lever or something which is well known. So I think that image of the organization is very crucial in corporate, especially when it comes to attraction, retention of talent, when it comes to corporate governance with investors, you know. So I think it's developed over a period of time. But at a, at a brand and company level connection, it's still weak. And, but I can't do it overnight, you know. It has to be done over a period of time, you know. So, I mean, we, we said that to increase our association, if, if there's an ad from, ad about parachute, then his product made by Marigo would come in, you know. But it's, it's a minor message. My major message has to be towards the brand parachute, you know. So it's still evolving. Our image in corporate circles and you know, in the job market is improved dramatically. So that challenge, to some extent, has has been met. But this will happen over a period of time. Yeah. Mr. Mariwala, I someone once told me that a little success makes you arrogant. A lot of success makes you humble, because no matter how good you are, you realize that to reach a certain level, yeah. you need the energy, effort, and brilliance of others. Yeah. Even the biggest men at some point have to stand on the shoulders of others. Yeah. Has that been your experience? So I have always been a very open person. When I say open, I mean, some people think that open is, suppose if you come to me and I have an open mind to hearing you out. Mm. Open, that's openness from a limited point of view. It's more reactive openness. Yeah. Now, if I have to be proactive as an open person, then I have to come to not only you, but whoever can help me in my journey. So what is new? What can I learn from you? It need not be you. It could be a person at the shop floor level also. How can we be different? So if I exhibit that curiosity, it has to be combined with humility because I can't, I have to come down to your level to answer, ask that question. And that search for learning or what's happening has to come from within, you know. So if you have that search, then you will read more, you will interact with more, you will take that extra effort to, to get that answers. And uh, I mean, I know that there are many leaders who think that they don't know it all, but at some stage, because they are not open, uh, they would tend to falter because if I don't listen to you, then you are reporting to me, for example, and I know that I know it all, you will not tell me only, because why should I tell you? Uh, he doesn't listen to me. So you'll, though you may be feeling very strong, but you'll be reluctant to tell me because I would, I'm not listening to you. But if, even if I have a different viewpoint compared to what, and if I react saying that, yes, Krish, thank you for bringing me this whatever idea. I appreciate that. And for these reasons, I don't agree with you. But please go on bringing such opportunities. You'll again come back to me. If I tell you, you're useless. I don't want to be there. You'll never come to me. So, you know, how you react in terms of, so there is a difference between criticizing and critique. You know, I have, by giving you negative signals, I have criticized you. By giving you positive signals, I have given a critique that I'm open to hearing and please come back to me. You know? Yeah, hey, there's a fantastic line in your book. It's, um, an op a mind like a parachute only only yeah. works when it's open. It's not, not my line, it's, it's been there. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so, fantastic line yeah. though. Um, so, you know, coming on that point of dealing with people in your organization, especially when you are the man on top, what, what do you think you did to ensure that you weren't inadvertently surrounded by yes men going through life? So, I think again, it starts with an assumption that every person has blind spots. And not a single person knows the overall context. And there is a lot of learning inputs which can come from others. If you have yes men, they will only agree to what you are saying. They will not critique you. They will not value add you because you only want people who are agreeing to you. And that's not good for any organization because you don't get opposing viewpoints, the blind spots are not covered. But if you have constructive no men, Constructive movement. That means if you you may not agree, but you are doing in a constructive way. You're telling me to do it differently for this this reason. 
and not just saying no don't do it you know so you're trying to convince me for whatever your viewpoint i think your organization needs more of that you need dissent you need uh, divergence because i think everything is getting very complex the whole world and the businesses are getting so complex with so much of geopolitical covid you know competitive environment technology disruptions you need constructive nomad and it's i think it it's we live in they say a vuka world right then yeah, there's so yeah. much uncertainty and but what do you think has helped you make sound decisions over time and when there is so much uncertainty and and is it that you know some people say that data allows you to make sound decisions but it, great decisions are made by intuition so i think you can't just be deciding without any data based on intuition i i don't know i i find it very difficult to say that i have intuition i will succeed without any data i think somewhere in your mind you have analyzed all that but that final shall i say if you are uncertain intuition would play a role you know that okay i am a little bit confused but karna hai abhi you know because i think i will succeed and i think to that extent intuition would play a role every time you may not succeed but i think ultimately it leads to a certain decision otherwise you you will go into analysis paralysis mode if you are confused you know if you are not able to decide and that also is not good for any organization or for any decision you know? yeah, right. but mr marigal i have just one last question yeah. when you look back at your life and career what is the overwhelming feeling that you have i think the overwhelming feeling which i still is not even my career is not over is to make a difference you know it's just not success monetarily or size or scale i think to make a difference to all our stakeholders so whether it is our shareholders or whether it is our employees or our associates or the society or at a personal level can i make a difference to whoever i've interacted with because ultimately that will that's the purpose which is driven by the organization you know? and that's where you get higher degree of satisfaction than just creating something for your own good Mr. Mariwala this was so fantastic thank you so much for taking the time it was wonderful hearing about all your stories thank you krishna all the best thank you